point pattern analysis studies the spatial arrangement of points in a geographical space. It has applications in a wide range of areas including wildlife ecology, biology, epidemiology, natural resource management, and criminology. This presentation explains the fundamentals of quadrat count methods as one common approach to conduct point pattern analysis. A basic understanding of probability distributions is essential for applying the chi-square test to identify a clustered point pattern. This test will be illustrated along with a real-world data set for which locations of termite collection sites are analyzed. Quadrat count methods aim to detect whether a point pattern deviates from spatial randomness. They do so by overlaying a set of cells called quadrats over the study area, counting the number of events in each quadrat, and analyzing the differences between observed and expected counts in quadrats. The shape, size, and arrangement of quadrats used for analysis can vary between different analysis approaches. One common approach is to use quadrats of equal size and shape so that they cover the whole study area without gaps, which is, for example, possible with squares, hexagons, or triangles. A common, simple starting point for analysis is to expect the same number of event counts in each quadrat independent of its location. This example shows event locations in a study area that is overlaid with a 5x5 five five grid consisting of square-shaped quadrats. In this case, the quadrats are contiguous and covering the whole study area. The figure to the right shows the number of events observed in each quadrat. The proportion of quadrats with zero events, one event, two events, and so on could then be compared to expected proportions based on a Poisson distribution to detect a deviation of the point pattern from complete spatial randomness. It is also possible to use event counts that are already summarized by region, such as counties. Such quadrats are then of different size and shape. Quadrats may even vary by the number of expected events due to factors that are known to affect the occurrence of this type of event. An example is the spatial analysis of sudden infant death syndrome cases, which are expected to be higher in counties that have a higher number of births. The upper map shows the number of expected sudden infant death syndrome cases for each county based on its number of births. The lower map shows the number of observed sudden infant death syndrome cases for each county. Quadrat analysis could then be used to analyze if observed sudden infant death syndrome cases were allocated to counties randomly, that is, based on the number of births in each county, or whether the allocation forms a clustered pattern. The focus of this presentation will be on the analysis of the first type of quadrat arrangement, which involves equally sized and shaped quadrats. Counting the number of events that occur in a set of quadrats can be done either by taking an exhaustive census that completely fills the study region with no overlaps, or by randomly placing quadrats across the study region. The two approaches are illustrated in this figure. The exhaustive census-based method is more commonly used in geographic applications such as spatial epidemiology or criminology where measured event data are all that is available, without the opportunity to resample the pattern. The random sampling approach is more frequently applied in fieldwork, for example, in surveying vegetation and plant ecology. It makes it possible to describe a point pattern without having complete data on the whole pattern, which is a distinct advantage for fieldwork. Typically, some events will be missed and some will be double counted. Whichever approach is applied, the outcome is a list of quadrat counts recording the number of events that occur in each quadrat. These counts are then compiled into a frequency distribution that lists how many quadrats contain zero events, how many contain one event, and so on. As the table shows, the frequency distributions for the exhaustive census and random sampling are similar, leading to comparable results. In quadrat analysis, the quadrat size will affect whether any patterns can be identified. The goal is to choose a size that is large enough to capture any pattern but not so large it obscures the pattern. 
The figure shows an example where clustering occurs on a smaller scale than the grid size and may remain undetected. A too large quadrat size may result in quadrats with about the same number of points in each quadrat obscuring the pattern. As opposed to this, a too small quadrat size may lead to many quadrats having few points or none, which is not useful as a description of pattern variability. It is common to search over multiple quadrat sizes to discern whether a pattern exists at some scales and not others. The lower figure shows the same point pattern overlaid with quadrats of different quadrat side lengths. Analysis of spatial patterns can involve measures that quantify the pattern using all features in the study area. These types of measures are called global statistics. A single quantity is computed that can be used to determine whether an observed spatial pattern deviates from a specified null hypothesis, such as complete spatial randomness. The second type of measures that identify variation across the study area are called local statistics. Local statistics use a subset of features local to a spatial location to identify whether the spatial pattern around the location deviates from a specified null hypothesis such as not having raised observed health events around pollutant sources. Quadrat count typically provides information about a point pattern as a whole and is therefore considered a global statistic. Using quadrat count methods in inferential statistics, that is, to answer whether an observed pattern could have been generated by a hypothesized spatial process necessitates the handling of various probability distributions. They will be briefly reviewed on the next slides. A probability distribution maps values of a random variable to their corresponding probabilities and is typically denoted as a table or an equation. A random variable is a set of values as a result of an experiment, such as tossing a coin twice, and their associated set of probabilities. A random variable can be discrete or continuous. On the next slides, we will first look at the characteristics of a discrete random variable and present examples of discrete probability distributions. A discrete variable can only take integer values such as 1, 2, or 10. An example for a discrete random variable is the count of heads that one gets when flipping a coin twice. Flipping the coin twice would be the experiment in this case. The left table shows the four possible outcomes of the experiment. Each outcome is equally likely and has a probability of 25%. The number of heads that come up will always be an integer number, and it takes on the values 0, 1, or 2. The probability distribution for the number of heads that come up is shown in the right table. It maps the outcome of 0 head counts to a probability of 25%, that of 1 head count to a probability of 50%, and that of two head counts to a probability of 25%. The Poisson distribution is another example of a discrete probability distribution. Based on a known average rate of events per time interval or spatial unit, it expresses the probability of a given number of events to occur within that given time interval or spatial unit. The average rate is denoted with the Greek letter lambda and usually taken from a sample, such as the observed point pattern in the study region. For a discrete random variable, the probability distribution is characterized by the so-called probability mass function. It can be presented in tabular form, in a graphical form, or as a formula and gives the probability that a discrete random variable is exactly equal to some value. The probability mass function of the Poisson distribution describes the probability of finding k events per fixed time or space interval based on the average rate lambda. It is shown here as a formula. The curves in the diagram show the probability mass functions for three different average rates. With an increased average rate from 1 through 4 to 10, the probabilities of observing more events per time or space interval indicated by k on the horizontal axis also increase. The Poisson distribution is crucial for spatial point pattern analysis since it closely approximates the expected proportion of quadrats with k events in a random point pattern, 
where k is an integer number greater than or equal to zero. This relationship between complete spatial randomness and the Poisson distribution can be utilized in the following example. Assume that the occurrence of the Japanese pine tree is randomly distributed and that on average four Japanese pine trees are found within an acre. What is the probability of finding seven pine trees within an acre? Substituting 4 for lambda and 7 for k in the probability mass function results in a probability of 6%. This matches visually with the probability value obtained for the curve with a lambda of 4 at a k value of 7. A continuous random variable differs from a discrete random variable in that it takes on an infinite number of possible outcomes. Therefore, the probability of observing any single value is equal to zero. As opposed to a discrete random variable where each possible value can be associated with the probability, for a continuous random variable, one determines the probability that the value falls in some interval instead. An example for a continuous random variable is the weight of a hamburger delivered in a fast food chain. Although the fast food chain might advertise a hamburger to weigh a quarter pound, the weight of a randomly selected hamburger will be slightly off a quarter pound. The probability distribution for the weight variable, since it is continuous, cannot be tabulated but needs to be characterized by a probability density function. The probability density function can be used to determine the probability that a random variable falls within a given interval. The probability corresponds to the area under the density function limited by the lower and upper boundary value of the interval. Using this method, it can, for example, be determined that the probability of the weight of a hamburger falls between 0.2 and 0.3 pounds is 90.4%. In this example, the probability density function follows a normal distribution, as shown in the diagram. Another example of a continuous probability distribution besides the normal distribution is the chi-square distribution. It is often used in hypothesis testing, as will be illustrated on the next slides. The chi-square distribution requires one parameter, k, to be fully specified, which is the degrees of freedom. The chart shows the probability density function of the chi-square distribution for different degrees of freedom. The probability density function can be used to compute the probability that a random variable takes the value in a specified interval, such as between 1 and 2. A chi-square test is a statistical hypothesis test in which the sampling distribution of the test statistic is a chi-square distribution when the null hypothesis is true. It is commonly used for quadrat analysis. Different methods are available to build a chi-square test statistic and use it in a chi-square test. This presentation explains the bin data approach. With that approach, given an average rate of events per spatial unit, we compute the expected number of quadrats that contain no events, that contain one event, that contain two events, and so on from the Poisson distribution. These numbers are then compared with the observed number of quadrats that contain 0, 1, 2, and so on events. The null hypothesis is that the observed frequency distribution of quadrat counts follows the Poisson distribution. The chi-square test statistic is calculated by finding the difference between the observed, O, and predicted, E, number of quadrats falling into each of the k bins, where the first bin may contain quadrats with zero events, the second one has quadrats with one event, and so on. This difference for each bin is then squared and divided by the expected number of quadrats of that bin. These ratios are then summed up over all bins. The chi-square test statistic is then compared to a critical value for a specified level of significance alpha and the degrees of freedom. The latter is computed as the number of bins minus 1. This critical value can be looked up in a chi-square distribution table. If the chi-square test statistic is larger than the critical value, the null hypothesis needs to be rejected. This example illustrates how to apply the chi-square test for binned data. The map shows a subset of observed locations of the invasive termite Coptotermes formusanus in southeast Florida. The study area is overlaid with a grid of 25 quadrats. 
Given the total of 107 events in the study area, an average rate lambda of 4.28 events per quadrat was determined. The table illustrates the computation of the chi-square test statistic. The left column shows that quadrats were classified into 10 bins depending on the number of events they contain. The last bin contains all quadrats with 9 or more events. Values in the second column show how many quadrats fall into each bin based on the observed point pattern. This is followed by the expected proportion of quadrats with k events per quadrat and the expected number of quadrats with k events. The last column combines observed and expected quadrat counts to compute the test statistic, which gives 101.194. The 10 bins result in 9 degrees of freedom. This chart is an excerpt from a chi-square distribution table. It contains critical values based on levels of significance shown on top of the table from left to right and degrees of freedom shown in the leftmost column. The level of significance corresponds to the area under the probability density function to the right of the critical value. This is the shaded blue area in the figure. For example, using a 1% level of significance and the previously identified 9 degrees of freedom, the lookup table provides a critical value of 21.666. Since the found chi-square test statistic of 101.194 is larger than the critical value, the null hypothesis needs to be rejected. This means that under complete spatial randomness, a chi-square test statistic as high as the observed one would occur in less than 1% of cases. A p-value calculator can provide even more precise information than the table. It reveals a much smaller p-value than 1%, namely 9.021 times 10 to the power of minus 18. This shows that we can be very confident in rejecting the null hypothesis that the underlying process which created the observed pattern was a random point process. This slide reviews the conceptual framework for the statistical analysis of spatial patterns. We illustrate its different components along with the chi-square test scenario shown before. In that chi-square test example, the null hypothesis was that the observed point pattern has been generated by an independent random process. In the context of quadrat count analysis, it is known from the mathematical description of an independent random process that the distribution of the chi-square test statistic follows that of a chi-square distribution. Taking a pattern of observed events such as termite collection sites, a chi-square test statistic can be computed that takes into account the theoretical and observed frequency distributions of quadrat counts. Finally, in a chi-square test, one compares the chi-square test statistic with a critical lookup value obtained from a chi-square distribution table. If the chi-square test statistic is larger than the critical value, the null hypothesis needs to be rejected at the chosen level of significance, and one can conclude that the observed pattern is unlikely to have been produced by complete spatial randomness. This slide summarizes the presentation. It started with an introduction to the principle of quadrat counts and the different types of quadrats typically used. This was followed by a brief review of probability distributions that are related to hypothesis testing in the context of geographic clusters. Next, the structure of the chi-square test was explained along with some examples.